thing I can say If I should take a notion To jump into the ocean Ain't nobody's business If I do, do, do love to do, do If I let my best companion Drive me right in the canyon Ain't nobody's business If I do, if I do if I dislike my lover and leave him for another, ain't nobody's business if I do. If I do. Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of our Prohibition Whiskeymentary on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. And I'm Ed. And today we'll be discussing the events that occurred after Prohibition was repealed, talking about its legacy and consequences, not only for the whiskey industry specifically, but for America in general. And there's a lot. And debating whether or not we actually learned a goddamn thing. <laughs> But first, here's Ed to quickly recap part three and the five factors that spelled Prohibition's doom. Right. What caused Prohibition to come to an end was a multifaceted thing. One was organized crime. You gave every petty criminal, every local criminal, the capital and means to expand until finally we have a national syndicate at the end of Prohibition that is running the country with gambling, booze, prostitution, drugs, money laundering. It's a nightmare. The second thing that did prohibition is that the rich people and the women who had backed it started to turn on it. Pauline Sabin's women's organization, she was a socialite. She's like, this isn't working. We see all the bad effects, the crime, and basically the fact that every American is becoming a criminal. The third factor we saw that caused the end of prohibition was, if you remember how rural the country was 100 years ago, there were some farmers that grew grain just for the liquor industry, grew grapes just for the wine industry, just for the brewers and the beer industry. And they're all the customers. I mean, I don't know last time you had a nice bowl of hops on your table <laughs> or, or how much, you know, I mean, there's only so much wheat you can make cereal out of. The rest of it, along with rye, especially in New York, I mean, all the rye farmers in Pennsylvania and New York, well, they were gone. They're dead. They're decimated. They're actually burning the rye crops where they were standing because no one wanted to buy them. Yeah, it was cheaper to burn it how than much it was rye, to use it. How much rye bread do you think we needed in 1920? <laughs> the fourth reason prohibition failed was the strictness of the Volstead Act. Had they made, you know, two and a half percent beer and five percent and under wine legal, it might have carried a lot longer. Some people religiously wanted to do wine. The working man coming home from the coal mine or the steel factory wanted a beer and they couldn't have it. And so they're doing it illegally. And once again, now the government's getting no tax money, right? So they're losing money. I know they have the income tax, but here's the thing. You got rid of all the jobs in the liquor industry. And then the last part, which is the Great Depression, came in 25, 40% of the people who lost their ability to earn money. That tax money wasn't being collected from income. So the income tax that you passed is no longer effective. You've lost your alcohol tax. So it's one plus one equals zero. (laughs) You're making no money. Organized crime soaring, rich people and women turning on the movement, the farmers turning on it because they can't make a living, strictness of the Volstead Act, and then the Great Depression comes. Yeah, the Great Depression was the nail in the coffin. Exactly. Yeah. Once again, the perfect storm to start Prohibition and the perfect storm to end it. Booyah. All right, so I'm going to do the state of whiskey at the very end of Prohibition. Like 1933 then? 1933. I found an article from Fortune Magazine in 1933. Wow, Fortune Magazine? was around in 1933 yeah holy crap the title of the article is whiskey and america a post-prohibition reunion Ooh. i mean this couldn't be more incredibly apropos to what we're doing right here so i'm just gonna read an excerpt of this 14 years five months and approximately four and one half days after it began national prohibition will end sometime between nine and five o'clock on december 5th 1933 it will be ironical If the 36th state is Ohio, where in 1874 the WCTU and Prohibition were simultaneously conceived, but it may as likely be Mormon Utah, which it ended up being, or the old rye distilling state of Pennsylvania. Anyway, Prohibition will end the 5th of December. On that day, the Volstead Act will become null and its kindred laws void, and the rusty legal machinery of 14 14 years ago will begin to grind again. 14 years with no legal booze. It's stunning to me. I know. It's 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 stupid. The last time that happened to me is between the ages of five and twenty (laughs) one. It was one in fourteen. No, so I guess it'd be seven and twenty one is my last fourteen year period I didn't drink legally. Oh, I see what you're saying. I didn't drink legally. Right. I drank a hell of a lot between eighteen and twenty one, I'll tell you that much right now. 
<laughs> people. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? On that day, manufacture, transportation, and the sale of intoxicating liquor will be permitted in 20 states where live almost exactly half of the 123 million inhabitants of the U.S. Take that, Volstead. Face. On that day, a billion-dollar industry will have a rebirth for which it has been feverishly and confusedly preparing these past nine months. It is not strictly accurate to say that the liquor industry will be reborn. The U.S. has already had two liquor industries. The one which is gestating now and will come to life on December 5th is the third of the dynasty. Its character will be shaped partly by legislation, partly by its own self-conscious character building, but mostly by the economic law of supply and demand. That demand is not hard to estimate in quantity. Before Prohibition, the U.S. drank 140 million gallons of liquor a year. During Prohibition, it drank not less than 200 million gallons. <laughs> it's such a, a study in human nature yep. that we would drink 60 million more gallons of alcohol. Because we were told because not to. Because we were told not to do it. Yeah. The demand then will be for at least 200 million gallons for the first year after Prohibition. But 200 million gallons of what? Statistically, the answer is easy. In 1913, the U.S. consumed native whiskey, rye and bourbon, 135 million gallons, 1.5 million gallons of scotch, and 5 million gallons of gin, plus an insignificant amount of other types of liquor, beer and wine. They didn't have rum in there? Uh, yeah, that's in, in the other types okay. of liquor. But it must not be supposed that such statistics will answer the question for 1934. So what will the U.S. drink next year? The answer is everything. I will tell you right now, I bet you that because liquor had a higher proof and got the job done quicker, was easier to sneak around, you probably had a heck of a lot more people drinking whiskey, gin, and things like that after Prohibition than going into it. Sure did. Mm -hmm. So what will the U.S. drink next year, the year after Prohibition ends? Uh, the answer is everything. It will experience no shortage. It may have to drink more gin than whiskey, but not for long. Its middle classes may exhibit a new gentility. And for the first time in U.S. history, wine may be a serious business, which ah. it did become. Absolutely. Napa Valley. And its working men may have sense enough to stick to beer. But the core of the whole matter is whiskey. The pre-Prohibition whiskey business wound up its affairs with a surplus of 64 million gallons. Prohibition drank up all but 4 million gallons of it. Evaporation reduced that to less than 3 million gallons. By last summer, there had been distilled some 10 million gallons of wow. newer whiskey. And then with repealing in the offing, another 7 million gallons had been distilled. There are now 20 million gallons of whiskey in the U.S., and it is apportioned approximately as follows. National Distillers Products Corporation with 10 million gallons. Shenley Distillers Corporation with 5 million gallons and a scattered among several other distillers, another 5 million. But because at the rate new whiskey is being stilled at three and a half million gallons per month, it will not be more than a year or two before the U.S. has all the potable rye and bourbon at once. If it uses its opportunities wisely, the U.S. whiskey business should be able to soon dominate the domestic field. Against imported liquor, it has the advantage of a $5 per gallon tariff. Against gin, it has the advantage of quality. Against the bootlegger, it has national, state, and local officers fighting tax evaders and not public benefactors. The dry states will have their bootleg problem, but where liquor sales are licensed, the police will protect the places that pay the fees that pay their salaries on payday, and the people are suddenly going to become conscientious on December 5th. Right, that guy's a hell of a writer for 1933. Isn't it? Do we have a name for him? Did you grab his name? No. No name. Well, I think it was an editorial. He's long dead, but yeah. the reality is that was a great synopsis of where whiskey was coming out of the darkness, if you will. Yeah, I was uh, particularly interested in the National Distillers Products Corporation, which held, at the time, half the whiskey in the entire country. Yeah, and who were they? Did you get any information on them? I did. Well, who are they, Scott? Uh, National Distillers Products, they were called. They are now still around, actually. They're a company called Quantum Chemicals, because sometime in the past 100 years, they required some chemical companies, and then ended up selling its liquor business to the Jim Beam Distillery, which is oh. now owned by Beam Suntory right. in 1987. That's interesting. The fact that they acquired that company in 1987, right before they launched what? Oh, yeah, the uh, small batch uh, Right before bourbons. they launched Basil Hayden. Right. Right before they launched Knob Creek. Right before they launched bakers and bookers so it's not to me lost that they went out and acquired this huge section of liquor right before they made what we and scott have referenced as the beginning of the renaissance of the modern whiskey push 
Yeah, the brands that National Distillers sold to Beam Suntory, well, Jim Beam at the time, uh, Old Granddad, okay. Old Crow, right. and Old Taylor, plus the DeKuyper cordials, you know, like peach schnapps sure, and all that sure, shit, sure. and uh, Gilby's Gin and Vodka. Right. So you're telling me that Old Crow's put out by Jim Beam today? Yeah. Oh, my God. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like Jim Beam is such a contradiction to me in the fact that they have some of the most delicious whiskeys I've ever tasted and they love to collect shitty ass whiskeys like Old Crow is just shitty ass whiskey I mean Old Granddad the bottom oh. expression is is really it's bad okay. too it's, uh, it's, it's bad it's cheap it gets you drunk basically it's like Jim Beam is saying hey we got a bunch of shit that'll get you drunk Yeah, if you got $18 and you don't really have a lot of self respect <laughs> And you hate yourself. <laughs> we have shit to get you to forget that you hate yourself. Right. But, but hey, oh. if you step over these people in the lobby who were <clears throat> passed out holding the bottle of Old Crow, mm. we have delicious, delicious expressions. And by the way, have you tried the new Booker? Because we change it every year. Have you had the Knob Creek cask strength that just came out? So they put out some wonderful expressions and you know that's a good time to segue into what i'm drinking today uh scott and i we talked about what we want to drink for this episode and we found out that early times was one of the first distilleries to get up and independent right after prohibition so we said hey why don't we drink some early times to celebrate that yeah i had a problem with that because i could only find it in the 1.75 liter bottle which is a lot of bad whiskey to buy even though it was only 25 dollars <laughs> um i just refused i had a lot of problems with that too but more the fact where i had to put it in my mouth <laughs> and then scott and i ma- basically my idea i said hey wait a minute we're wait, doing was the- it was it your idea i'm taking credit <laughs> It it didn't take a lot to get Scott on board. I'll say that. I said, hey, listen, why don't we drink whatever we want to drink? Actually, you know, I think it was Scott's idea. But (laughs) I said, hey, but I did say this because I like when Scott says an idea. I like to repeat it back to him like it's mine because it's fun. (laughs) Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we drink whatever whiskey we want to celebrate the fact that Prohibition's over and we can drink whatever whiskey we want. Yeah, we can drink whatever we want. To keep it somewhat in the frame of reference, I chose the Henry McKenna tenure from Heaven Hill Distillery, which the distillery distillery really came into business in 1935 Hmm. which if you think about it if you started to distill liquor and age it at the end of prohibition that's what they would have had to do to really start putting product out only two years after the repeal yeah so i thought heaven hill would be the proper company to salute and that henry mckenna is my favorite product by them and in my opinion one of the most flavorful tasty wonderful bourbons yes it's delicious it's like it's spectacular it's smooth it's won tons of awards. If you've never had Henry McKenna, celebrate Prohibition and buy yourself a bottle if you can find it because it's getting scarcer by the day. Yeah, go back and listen to episode 13 where we talk all about it. Yes, we gush about it. Yeah. I'm drinking a Will It Rye, which was uh, episode 14, uh, just because. It's delicious. And once again, to celebrate that we can drink whatever effing right. whiskey it has, you want. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Prohibition. So Not at all. Yeah. They were well after the yeah, 30s. Well after. They are like the 50s, right? Yeah. So we're going to talk about the legacy and consequences of Prohibition, and we have a couple of topics, and I just have a bowl here with the topics in them, and I'm going to pick them at random, and we're going to talk about it. Ready? Yep. The dry and wet counties in America. Well, I'll start out on that. Sure. Um, All right. So real quick, the national prohibition ended with the passage of the 21st Amendment. But state and local restrictions of liquor continued even up until this day. Because Section 2 of the 21st Amendment allowed the states to write their own laws governing alcohol. Mm. So basically, if, for example, a state like Oklahoma, which doesn't pass the prohibition amendment till 1959 if you tried to take liquor in there in 1933 you would have had a problem right mississippi was the last to hold out they didn't come around to 1966 jesus are you fucking kidding me 1966 the beatles are out before they repealed prohibition god damn fucking mississippi can you get your shit together mississippi seriously i have no problem with the people listening to our podcast because they're nice we like they're not from mississippi i guarantee you (laughs) well wait we should check Uh, we'll do that in our last call episode stay tuned (laughs) yeah so i have a list here of states where their counties like 37 arkansas counties are dry 24 alabama counties are dry in texas voters in 450 dry municipalities voted to become wet between 2004 and 2012 this is modern history here and there are still apparently 126 municipalities in texas where you can't buy alcohol it's unbelievable one of the most surprising ones is in tennessee more county home to the jack daniels distillery 
is dry. You can't drink Jack Daniels in the county where they make Jack Daniels. How fucked up is that? It's really bizarre. And Arkansas is one of the most fucked up states, in case you're wondering. It's still <laughs> fucked up today. Don't go to Arkansas if you want to get drunk, all right? Okay, so on the list of places that have banned us we have topeka kansas right the entire states of arkansas and mississippi fuck mississippi for a thousand reasons all you've given us is elvis slavery and sadness you gave us jefferson davis president of the fucking confederacy so- and now you can't drink all i would want to do if i was in mississippi is drink it's hot you have fucking mosquitoes the size of your fist <laughs> Yeah, fucking the, the most dirt roads per capita of every state. Is that true? Get your shit together down there. Anyway, um, some states don't allow the sale of beverages on major holidays. That was amazing when I saw that. Kansas. You can't buy liquor on Easter. Nope. Thanksgiving. Mem- Memorial Day. Christmas. Labor Day. July 4th. Yep. In Kansas, anytime when you most want to drink, you better buy it the day before because they don't allow it the day of because they think you're going to get too extra. It's fucking ridiculous. They think that it's going to get crazy. Yeah. All right. So let's pick another topic. All right. Ready? Yeah. Women's rights. Well, the one thing that we see from the end of World War One going into Prohibition is women were working in the factories, just not the same level as World War Two as Rosie the Riveter and all that, but they definitely gained some independence. The fact that they were able to rally in the numbers of millions of people against alcohol in the temperance movement. Right. They got the right to vote in 1919. Right. The 19th Amendment. Right. So women definitely benefited during the era of prohibition in a lot of ways. Also, um, I think we talked about this on one of our parts where uh, women uh, started going to all these speakeasy bars uh, where right. they That's didn't go true. to the male oriented saloons because that was Never. considered like really, really low you're, class. You're right. The speakeasy, though, for some reason, and became socially acceptable for couples to go there and it kind of changed the way american celebrates which we still do today yeah of the uh, period labeled as the jazz age or the roaring 20s known for its glamorous carefree flapper which was uh, what women called themselves in a particular style of dress and dancing they had now had the right to vote they rejected the last vestiges of victorianism exactly and they were free to hold progressive views about fashion sexuality and the so-called vices right hashtag fuck the corset <laughs> yeah, seriously. Okay, next topic. Uh, marijuana. All right. All right, so I'll start this one off. Four years after the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition, Franklin Roosevelt signed the Marijuana Tax Act into law prohibiting the drug. So four years after we get alcohol back, then they decide to take marijuana away. So there was only four years where you could do both legally. Ask Babe Ruth. He'll tell you it was a crazy fucking four years. <laughs> or Louis Armstrong. Right. There are more states now moving to decriminalize marijuana. Right now, 11 states, it's legal for recreational use, and more than 30 allow its use for medical purposes. Oh, wow. 30. Yeah. We all have a friend or 10 who like to smoke up every now and then. I'm 52 years old. I have people from when I was in college 30 years ago, and I know they smoke every week since then illegally. Mm. These people are lawyers and bankers and businessmen, and they, their whole careers at times were in jeopardy. You know, they didn't like to drink. I don't really like to drink, but I need to relax. And so instead of having a glass of wine, I like to smoke a joint. So just like with the end of Prohibition, where we see a lot of Americans who are criminals. We have that going on today. Yeah. You hear a lot about the drug war, and it's pretty much worse than Prohibition ever was because we have half a million people in prison just because, you know. For drugs. Yeah, for drugs. And to many economists, about twice as many homicides as we would expect if drugs were actually legal. It's kind of fucked up. Chicago has like 500 gun deaths a weekend sometime. All right, well, 500 weekends. That was an exaggeration, but they've had 20 in a weekend. Almost all of them are about drug territories. I mean, it's kind of what we were seeing in the uh, prohibition days with uh, Al Capone and all the, you know, the drug wars, the fights for territory. And the only time it stopped was when they all met in Lake City. We talked about that last time. They all had like a stroll on the boardwalk and everyone was fine. Maybe, maybe that's what we should do for the guys in Chicago. Hey, fellas, come to Atlantic City and walk the boardwalk. Come to the beach. Get some saltwater taffy. Yeah. Calm down. Yeah, some fudge. It's in the Shrivers. It's good stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shrivers is really good. It is really good. That's the best saltwater taffy. Mm. All right. Next topic. Alcohol consumption and availability. So I found a site where each state was rated from a scale of one to five on how wet they are, how dry they are today. A lot of factors are into it. How late your liquor store stayed open. How late your bar stayed open. There are some states where all bars have to be closed by midnight. 
There are states like Utah, which doesn't allow any beer more than 3.2%, which was the original allowable amount from the Roosevelt Act, right? The Beer Act. Mm -hmm. If you have more than that, let's say you have like a Goose Island bourbon finish. Right. Any of the barrel bourbon beers we did on that episode. So if you have an 8% beer, for example, in Utah, that is classified as a liquor. It has to be served at room temperature in a state-operated liquor store. No. So no, not going. Fuck you, Utah. West Virginia has a maximum of six percent for its beer, which to anyone who drinks beer nowadays knows that's not even fucking beer yet. <laughs> I mean, really, what six percent? Most craft beer is well, it's okay, but I mean, most craft beers start at five and go to like yeah. eleven. I think Coors Light's four point something. So I can drink Coors Light all day, and I'll get full before I get drunk. <laughs> Now, what's interesting is South Carolina allows up to 17.5% beer. What? Yeah. That makes no sense. See, these laws make no sense. Right. And Thanks, Prohibition. Eight, 18 states have alcohol beverage control laws, which means they have a state store. Like Pennsylvania near us has state stores. Yeah. Stupid. So you can go to Pennsylvania and you get beer and wine at a distributor all over the place. But the state stores close at nine and their prices are regulated. There's not like a lot of sales and stuff. It's kind of bullshit. Yeah. Everyone I know in Philly that I work with if they want whiskey they come into jersey to buy it yeah come to jersey for your gas your pork roll and your whiskey <laughs> why gas rest of the world because we don't pump our own gas in jersey and we have and it's cheaper than everybody else's you tell me yeah but don't come here for the property taxes no it is legal today to make your own beer and wine at home but you still cannot make your own distilled liquor which is a felony right so that's a legacy you want to talk about yeah a lot of people i know including scott scott made his own beer for years i did i have many friends that make their own wine but you cannot make your own whiskey or your gin or your rum against law and you'll go to prison (laughs) but while you're in prison you can make some sick ass jailhouse hooch you know what i'm saying yeah Uh, apparently uh, Americans now drink less liquor than before prohibition. So I guess yes. it, you could argue that it did have its intended effect in reducing consumption. Well, um, today, the United States isn't even top 10 in the world in liquor consumption. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Today, we're about 2.2 gallons per person. Well, the number one is Luxembourg. I know. I know. I see that. Ireland, which everyone knows is number two and tongue in cheek hysterical. That's not a surprise. Like, I mean, Luxembourg ruins it because they're fucking Luxembourg. Like, they always do weird shit. Like, just stay out of the way. I mean, I mean, and it's not close. Like no. four point one one gallons, I have. Right, is they, that what you have? Right, Luxembourg people drink over four gallons of booze. Yep. Ireland is three point six two gallons. Hungary is three point five nine. And so we're, America's not in the top ten. That's that. That is pretty amazing, actually. Right. It, well, is, it is because remember, so a lot of the states get in our way. Oklahoma, Utah, right. and Alabama have stupid, shitty laws that get in the way of people drinking. And Mississippi. Don't mention them in front of me right now. You know how I feel about them. <laughs> my man. Um, I find this hard to believe. So. It says here it's harder to find a drink now than it was during Prohibition. How many bars and speakeasies must there have been? You can't go anywhere in New Jersey without tripping over a bar or a restaurant that has a liquor license. Right. And that's another fact about the or a uh, liquor store for that matter. The chart that I saw that makes it a place wet or dry. New Jersey is a three. Pennsylvania is a two. California is like a five. I'm kind of excited about going to a five and see what that's like. You just walk down the street, just people give you like test tube shots in your mouth or something. I don't know. Like, I want to know what that's like. (laughs) All right. Next topic, the mob. I mean, we've talked about the mob a lot during this. We have. And what I would say is that when they repealed prohibition, they expected the mob to disappear. Yeah. I feel like it was really naive of people to think that organized crime would just go away. They made so much money during that time that it was too late. Like, you had already created this monster, and they're just not going to go away. And it's because of Prohibition that we were able to expand it to legal businesses, restaurants, legal bars, trucking companies, shipping companies. The prostitution was still there. The gambling was still there. They had moved their money into the drug and narcotic industries. Follow me on this. Prohibition made the mob strong, Mm -hmm. which caused the drug epidemic of the 60s because by the time they got their shit together they were able to flood the markets with illegal products yeah next topic the last two are kind of related so let's do them together yeah so we got bars and we got yeah cocktails a large portion of your alcohol during prohibition was homemade shit Mm. tastes like rubbing alcohol they called it bathtub gin i mean imagine and so what do you do when something tastes bad what do you add to it Right. Sugar. If Sugar. You can. Yeah. And fruit juice. I mean, what are our, most of the bad cocktails? Like the, the shit that you drink at a bar just to get fucking wasted when you're in college. They're, they're all fruit juice and sugar. Oh, right. It's like right? kamikazes and, and lemon drops. And, yeah. and yeah, yeah. 
even the cosmos and shit like that and uh, like exotic rum drinks and you know punches right. and all that n- nonsense that was all created in the prohibition well the point is this is where the manhattan the old-fashioned this is the gin and tonics of the warrior coke and soda but on top of that i will say this there is a lot of non-alcoholic cocktails now why is that relevant well because the vanilla milk punch or the philadelphia cocktail or um the pineapple fizz or the the lemon fizz or the grenadine ricky all these stay exactly the same after prohibition but we add liquor to them I so see. so those were drinks that they were making without alcohol right. so these are, people could drink and like rest. pretend yes and there are bars popping up that are non-drinking bars so that recovering alcoholics can be social and they have juice lounges and things like that that mm-hmm. are geared just for them yeah so that kind of takes us into bars you'll see a lot of speakeasies popping up all over the place sort of uh, romanticizing the 1920s and the prohibition era uh-huh. we go to one ourselves we talked about it on episode 15 with anders the right. bartender at the local lounge and it is sort of a speaking you s- is. slide the door over and you walk on in right. and everyone's glad to you see walk you into the local pub and they have a chalkboard full of all their beer and it's on like a farm door rail and you just kind of like slide it to the r- left and go on in yeah. and then you close it behind you and anybody new person walking in has no idea if they're not a regular they have no idea where you are now is it a secret not no. i don't know it's not a secret no. but people come in and all the time yeah it's almost similar to uh how the open secret that it was back in the 20s like everybody knew that that door over there in the laundromat there was a bar back there right they knew that and the term speakeasy i should mention and it wasn't because it was a secret like hey let's speak easy about it it means when you're in there don't scream you know speak right. easy be quiet don't get us busted that's why they were called speakeasy yeah i always thought it was so that you could speak easy with each other about drinking alcohol boom boom, yeah. boom so i can speak easy yeah well well so, so i can, can speak, speak easy oh my jesus Oh, my cheese it Oh, my cheese it <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so cut. Now, we're going to, you know, we're kind of winding down now. The legacy of Prohibition, it was basically where we are now is the Renaissance period. Like, we have finally recaptured what I believe and what Scott believes is what was lost. If you want to learn about what's been happening in the past, uh, 20 years. you know, 20, 30 years, uh, you can just go back and listen to all of our podcasts. I mean, I think we did, a, you know, I'm not patting ourselves on the back here, but I think we did a pretty good job of running through the history of a lot of brands, a lot of distilleries, a lot of the alcohol that's out now and was out before. Right. Um, what I want to ask you, Ed, yeah. is do you think we learned anything as a nation from Prohibition? I mean, I'm going to say initially no, because marijuana has been banned for 100 years. But I think that that lesson is what's helping marijuana get turned over so quickly. Mm -hmm. Once again, federally, they still won't fucking pull the trigger. They still won't make it legal. And by the way, I don't smoke pot, but it's asinine to waste state and police resources on a substance that is being used by a third of the population. Right. right? This is not heroin. This is not the opiate epidemic. This is people smoking a joint on a Friday night and going to sleep. You know, I've never heard anybody going violent on a shooting spree because they smoked a joint. Right. I just never have. Yeah. I mean, I do it sometimes, but I would probably do it more if I could, if it was legal. You don't have the mechanisms to get it. Right. Right. Right? Because it's illegal. Well, you're a professional, Scott. So imagine if you get clipped trying to buy a gram of weed or something. I know. know. I don't do it for the main reason that my profession would frown upon it. And I love my job too much to put it at risk risk right you know which is why i'm doing whiskey podcast right. I watch all the way this direction right, it's not the ganja podcast um, so i'm like ha ha it's legal i'm drinking whiskey what are you gonna do about it nothing 21 mm-hmm. times two plus 10 so um <laughs> wait yeah oh shit yeah, you are i am thank you for my birthday yeah. uh everybody yeah, whiskey too. tangent at gmail.com happy birthday it's Ed's. true it was just ed's birthday uh january 2nd yeah january 2nd that's right yeah all right so i'm glad that you kind of agree with me about how we didn't learn a damn thing yeah so i want to end with this uh very short essay about i honestly don't think we've learned a damn thing drinking is still a problem yeah organized crime is still a problem 
Right. The denigration of immigrants and minorities is still a problem. Correct. Millions are still rotting in jail for possession of marijuana and other drugs, some of whom have now lost constitutional rights to vote as a result of simply wanting to feel good. Mm -hmm. The Prohibition Party still exists, believe it or not. It does still exist. Yes, it does. Still wanting to go back to the days of telling people what to do and how often they get to do it. People right now are still trying to ban everything from abortion to guns to gay marriage to Burger King videos in which people say the word damn because I guess that's offensive now. And there is no discussion of compromise solutions for anything anymore. In fact, compromise is now a dirty word. It's a word that implies weakness and unwillingness to stick to your guns. So much so that all that remains are people with extreme positions screaming with the loudest voices, but actually members of the smallest groups. I mean, just go into Facebook or right. Twitter. I oh mean, or don't really don't. I mean, ask the dries how that went for them when it was their own unbridled extremism in the sheer folly of their uncompromising positions that cost them the very thing that they'd fought so hard to win. Yep. The oft-repeated axiom that those who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it is apt. But a better one, I think, is that those who don't care to remember history are doomed to become it. But hey, at least we can still drink. Absolutely. And uh, from all of us here at Whiskey Tangent, me and you, Scott and Ed, <laughs> sometimes Gabe, sometimes Gabe. If you enjoyed this uh, whiskey mentory that we put together, then good. I mean, we honestly don't know if 200 people are going to listen to it, yeah. 2,000 people or 20. But the reality is we did it because we wanted to do something special. And I feel like we did a very interesting time period that affected the whiskey industry in this country for 100 years. And here we are now. And we want to celebrate that by doing this for you. And so for Scott, I'm Ed. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out our next episode, which is way better than this one. Oh, yeah. Also, follow and like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Whiskey Tangent. And follow us on Twitter at Whiskey Tangent. You can follow me personally at That Whiskey Guy. And follow Scott at Giant Cup of Awesome, spelled A-W-S-U-M, just to be annoying. Hey! You can email us any questions, comments, or love at whiskeytangent at gmail.com. And of course, you can find us always at our podcast website, whiskeytangent.podbean.com.